one. Thank you. 
How's that? Good? Yeah, it sounds fine to me. Microphone, so people here find you here. They can 
maybe not. Maybe. How's that? So stress testing is something we commonly do, and there's a few things we got to review about them. Common indications for stress testing are risk stratification in patients who do not have known coronary disease, diagnostic purposes when you're trying to uncover coronary disease in a patient presenting with symptoms suggestive of angina, or prognostic purposes for patients who have known coronary artery disease for previous MI. The key to stress testing is it's done in stable patients. So when we talk about risk stratification, we're going to look at the Framingham ATP3 data versus the newer ASBD risk calculator, prognostic purposes, and exercise treadmill test and the Duke treadmill score. But the majority of our talk will focus on the diagnostic purposes of stress testing because that's what you're going to see as primary care providers in the hospital. If your com patient's coming in with chest pain or an anginal equivalent and you're trying to diagnose whether or not their symptoms are due to stuff with coronary artery disease. In regard to the stress testing, we'll go to some of the modalities, the sensitivity and specificity of tests, contraindications, and appropriate use criteria. Uh, we have uh, occasional discordance between the guidelines for American College of Cardiology and appropriate use criteria. Appropriate use criteria determines whether or not you get paid for the test. Even if the guidelines say it's okay and appropriate use says it's inappropriate, you're not going to get paid. So there's occasional discordance between those two. So risk stratification with an exercise treadmill test, an asymptomatic patient without known coronary disease, there's no class 1 indication for asymptomatic patients. There's no class 2A indication for asymptomatic patients. Only when you get down to class 2B do you have indications in, to stress test asymptomatic patients for risk stratification. Those are patients with multiple risk factors. For asymptomatic men older than 40 and women older than 50 who plan to start vigorous exercise or involved in high-risk occupations, um, or high risk for developing obstructive coronary disease due to chronic kidney disease or renal failure. There's no indication for routine screening in asymptomatic patients. Risk stratification with echo or MPI in asymptomatic patients. In the absence of comorbidities, stress echo or MPI is inappropriate or uncertain per appropriate use criteria. Stre stress echo and MPI are always inappropriate in low risk asymptomatic patients. Um, so for risk stratification, prior to ordering a stress test, it's important to determine the absolute risk the patient has of developing um, coronary heart disease, MI, or a cardiac-related death over a 10-year period of time. That's what you're trying to calculate is their risk of having a hard endpoint due to coronary artery disease. So it's previously been done on the ATP3 data, Framingham data, um, and that's what the appropriate use criteria still uses because most of that was developed in 2010. Um, now the ACC recommends using the atherosclerotic vascular disease calculator, which is a risk estimator based on uh, pooled cohort data. It's more accurate. But in review to ATP3, because this is what everybody learns in medical school, is the absolute risk is defined as the probability of developing uh, coronary heart disease, including MI or CAD-related death over a given period of time. And we're referring to 10-year risk calculator of a hard cardiac event. Um, so a low-risk patient is defined by the age-specific risk level that is below average. In general, low risk correlates with a 10-year um, absolute risk of less than 10%. Moderate risk is defined by age-specific risk level that is average or above average, and its 10-year absolute risk for developing a coronary heart disease hard endpoint is between 10 and 20%. High-risk patient is defined by the presence of diabetes in a patient older than 40, peripheral arterial disease, or other coronary risk equivalent or a 10-year risk um, greater than 20%. So recently, in 2013, the ACC developed the atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease risk estimator. Like I said, it's based on pool, pooled cohort analysis, and it provides increased accuracy in identifying high-risk patients. So particularly with the new statin uh, guidelines and blood pressure guidelines, the atherosclerotic vascular disease risk estimator is what you're going to be using to determine statin therapy and blood pressure therapy. Um, this is a calculator that's available online or on your iPhone, iPad, any of that stuff. Um, it's a quantitative estimate of absolute risk based upon data from representative patient samples. But it's important to note when you're talking about risk assessment or risk stratification, just because two individuals have the same estimated risk, it doesn't mean that they will have the same event of interest. For example, if the 10-year risk is 10%, this indicates that among 100 patients with the entered risk factor profile, 10 would be expected to have a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. 
So it divides patients into two categories. Low risk is a risk less than 7.5% for a hard cardiac event in 10 years versus greater than or equal to 7.5%. So in conclusion, for risk stratification, like I said, we'll just talk about it briefly. It utilizes, we now utilize the ASGD calculator to guide medical therapy as indicated by high or low risk. Um, appropriate use criteria for imaging studies is still based on the ATQ3 risk stratification model. So we'll briefly discuss prognostic purposes because as most primary care providers, you guys aren't going to be taking care of post-MI patients um, and trying to determine their progno prognosis. That's something we'll do. Uh, it's strongly validated with exercise testing and MPI. So one of the strongest and most consistent prognostic markers identified in exercise testing is maximum exercise capacity. Um, is influenced by resting level of ventricular dysfunction and the amount of further left ventricular dysfunction induced by exercise. So we can quantify exercise capacity based on maximal exercise duration, how many minutes did they go on a Bruce protocol, uh, their metabolic equivalent achieved, maximum workload achieved, or maximum heart rate, heart rate, blood pressure product are all different ways we quantify it. Here on our treadmill test, you'll see uh, exercise duration and a MET level. A second group of prognostic markers that we get from exercise testing relates to exercise-induced ischemia, which includes exercise-induced ST uh, deviation and exercise-induced angina. So what we utilize for prognostic purposes and to some extent uh, risk gratification is the Duke treadmill score because it incorporates both prognostic markers of exercise capacity and exercise-induced ischemia. It's useful for risk gratification diagnosis prognosis. The score was originally developed using data from 2,842 inpatients with known or suspected CAD who underwent exercise testing before diagnostic angiography. If your Duke treadmill score is five or greater, you're considered low risk. If it's four to negative 10, they're moderate risk. And if it's less than um, negative 11, they're high risk. What does this really mean to you guys? Low risk score has a 97% five year survival. Intermediate risk is 90%. And high risk is 65%. Um, in high risk patients, 74% had three vessel disease or left main disease. So high risk findings are strongly positive, uh, have very poor outcomes. So patients with poor exercise capacity, hey, they only walked three and a half minutes before they reached target heart rate, um, are at high risk for left main or three vessel disease, have a high clinical event rate. Other variables that you might see mentioned in the exercise test report include exercise induced hypotension or inappropriate heart rate response, whether they had chronotropic incompetence during exercise, they were unable to have a heart rate increase, or after exercise, their heart rate stayed persistently elevated for long duration post-exercise in their recovery, which is known as heart rate recovery. We use ST depression um, on a diagnosis level as far as prognostic level goes. It's a generally weaker prognostic assessment than those previous variables mentioned. So by far the most common reason you're going to order stress tests is for diagnostic purposes in a symptomatic patient. Um, so this is what we'll focus on. So prior to ordering a stress test for diagnostic purposes, the ACC guidelines are very clear, so are the appropriate use guidelines, that you have to determine that when the presence of symptoms may represent obstructive CAD, you have to determine the pretest probability of the patient having coronary artery disease before you order the stress test. So we've talked about pretest probability probably fairly frequently when you're on cardiology rotation because it really is a big driver of how we handle patients and manage them. Uh, very low pretest probability patients have a less than 5% pretest probability of CAD. Low pretest is less than 10. Intermediate is 10 to 90, and that's the key group right there. And high, high pretest probability is greater than 90%. So um, based on the ACC data, there's different ways of assessing pretest probability, but the one that's been most validated is based on age, gender, and presenting symptoms. We've previously talked about, and you've talked about on cardiology rotation, how to define angina, typical angina, atypical angina, and non-anginal symptoms. What's important to note is the few cases where you actually have high-risk findings. The majority of your younger patients um, and female patients are, are intermediate, low, or very low risk. So if you have a 45-year-old female with atypical angina, she's low risk. And that's an important thing to know because that helps determine the sensitivity and specificity of the test you're getting. If you order a test in a low-risk patient, you decrease the sensitivity and specificity of it. 
So the important part about that is the table only predicts patients without a complicated history or current EKG findings suggestive of ischemia. Um, history and electrocardiographic evidence of prior infarction dramatically alter pretest probability. Um, not incorporated into that algorithm or other coronaries risk factors um, like presence of peripheral arterial disease or things of that nature, diabetes. Regardless, though, the age, gender, and anginal symptoms are the most well-validated assessment for pretest probability. And all of our guidelines for stress testing say that that's what you should do prior to ordering the stress test, whether it's a stress echo, an MPI, or an exabest segment. So when you order a cardiac stress test, there's two components you have to think about as a physician. There's the stress modality. How are we going to stress the heart? Um, and then there's the imaging modality, if any. So it's also imperative to review the indications and the contraindications to the test. Am I ordering the right test in the right patient? So stress component is traditionally comprised of an exercise treadmill. Some institutions use a bicycle, uh, a recumbent bike. Dobutamine is a stressor. Adenosin or ragadenosin are also vasodilatory stressors that we can use. Um, imaging components composed of echocardiography. Here we have myocardial perfusion imaging. And over the last few months, we've also acquired uh, cardiac CT ability here. Although CT is not a stress modality, it does have an important role in risk stratification and diagnosis of coronary artery disease. We'll talk about that later. Um, so ways that you could potentially order these tests, because sometimes people are confused with it, is you could just order an exercise treadmill. So it's a stress test only with an exercise EKG, no imaging component. Or you could get a stress echocardiogram where you put them on the treadmill and you get an echo uh, at maximum heart rate. So that, then there's the exercise treadmill MPI. I don't want you to forget about this one because it's an important test and frequently not used appropriately. Um, so you can still put somebody on a treadmill, have them get to peak heart rate, and then inject the isotope and then put them under the nuclear scan. Um, dobutamine echocardiogram, so you use dobutamine as your stresso, stressor and echo as your imaging modality. And then here we use, for our myocardial perfusion imaging, when it's uh, a pharmacological stress, we use Lexi-Skin here. We don't use chrysanthemum or adenosine here anymore. So the standard exercise treadmill test is the procedure of choice rather than stress imaging for non-invasive non assessment of coronary disease in a patient without prior coronary revascularization who is capable of adequate exercise and who has a normal or near normal resting EKG. So there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts in there, right? They've got to be without prior coronary revascularization, and they've got to be able to exercise, and they've got to have a normal or near normal EKG. If they meet those criteria, an exercise treadmill test without imaging is the, is the test of choice in these patients. So what EKG changes would preclude using the exercise treadmill test for diagnosis of suspected coronary artery disease? Pre-excitation, electronic repaced ventricular rhythm, greater than one millimeter ST resting depression, or complete left funnel branch block. Do we still stress patients with a right funnel branch block? Uh, exercise treadmill test can still be used to assess exercise capacity, though, regardless of baseline EKG for diagnostic purposes. If you want to see how far a patient can go, what their, e what their exercise tolerance is to give them prognosis, it's okay if their, if their EKG is abnormal, if they have a left bundle branch block. You're not doing it to check for ischemia. You're doing it to check exercise tolerance. Those are two very separate things. Um, so diagnostic testing is most valuable in patients with an intermediate pretest probability. Exercise testing for diagnosis of coronary disease is most commonly expressed by sensitivity and specificity. Uh, in studies where patients agreed to get on the treadmill and exercise and then undergo coronary angiography, the sensitivity and specificity of one millimeter of horizontal or downsloping ST depression for diagnosis of coronary artery disease were 50% and 90%. And that's an incredibly high um, or specificity for just the treadmill test. And this data varies based on what studies you look at, but these numbers were taken out of the American College of Cardiology guideline on exercise testing. So the true diagnostic value of exercise EKG lies in its high specificity. So negative test result in a, um, in a test with high sensitivity is useful for ruling out a disease, but an exercise treadmill alone is not very sensitive. So low sensitivity gives a lot of false negatives. But a positive test result in a test with high specificity is used for, useful for ruling in disease. So when this is appropriately applied, i.e. an intermediate pretest probability patient, exercise treadmill testing has very high specificity. The test rarely gives false positives in healthy patients, 
Um, so the sensitivity and specificity of treadmill testing is only accurate when applied to the appropriate patient population. As I previously mentioned, they've got to be intermediate or high pretest probability. When an exercise treadmill test is done on a 45-year-old female with atypical chest pain or any low or very low pretest probability patient, the specificity falls to 50%. So then you've got a test with a 50% sensitivity and 50% specificity. It's a huge increase in your false positive. So you have to apply it to the right patient. Um, absolute contraindications to exercise testing are any ongoing acute coronary syndrome. So if the patient had chest pain three hours ago and you think it's unstable angina, they're not a candidate for stress testing. Um, acute MI within two days, unstable angina not previously stabilized, uncontrolled cardiac arrhythmias, um, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. We don't put those patients on the treadmill. You can stress severe aortic stenosis, but not, not on a symptomatic patient. Um, uncontrolled symptomatic heart failure, acute pulmonary embolism or pulmonary infarction, myocarditis, pericarditis, and acute aortic dissection. Relative contraindications to exercise are known left main coronary stenosis, moderate stenotic valvular heart disease, electrolyte abnormalities, um, severe hypertension, systolic greater than 200 or diastolic greater than 110, or tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias. A note about exercise testing, anything you do with treadmill or, or dobutamine that requires an adrenergic response, you got to hold the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers on these patients. You know, the night before the stress test, they can't get their nighttime dose and their AM dose and then get on the treadmill two hours later because they'll never get to target heart rate. So you have to hold their medicine. But if a guy's got AFib that's rate controlled, you're not going to take him off his beta blocker for, you know, 18 hours or whatever it is, 12 hours, so he can get a stress test. So an exercise test in a patient who needs beta blockade or calcium channel blocker for rate control might not be the best test. Lexi scanning those patients, better idea. Other relative contraindications, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mental or physical impairment, leading to inability to exercise, high degree AV block. This is an algorithm provided by the American College of Cardiology for whether or not, kind of how you should work through um, ordering a stress test for a patient. But basically, if the patient has contraindications to stress testing, you can, and you, they have symptoms suggestive of angina, you can go straight to coronary angiography. Um, if they're high risk and have warning symptoms, you can go to angiography. If the patient can't exercise, but they need a stress test for diagnostic purposes, it's a pharmacological st stress test. If their EKG is in, um, interpretable, you can do an exercise imaging study. If it's not, or I mean, if it is interpretable, you can do an exercise stress test, but if it's not, you do an exercise imaging study. Uh, high risk test results should get angiography. So after looking at exercise treadmill tests, let's just briefly review exercise and dobutamine stress echo. Exercise echocardiography has a mean sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of 86, 81, and 85%. I don't know how to make graphs in this. They probably look a lot nicer than just numbers. But it's a highly sensitive and specific test. Uh, dobutamine stress echo, when comparable to exercise echocardiography, has a slightly lower sensitivity of 82% and a slightly higher specificity of 84%. It should be pointed out that when normalcy rate is applied as a substitute for specificity, which requires coronary angiography, the false positive rate is only 10% with, with stress echo. Um, so a positive stress echo is highly positive. That's what you need to get out of that. If they have a positive stress echo, it's unlikely to be a false positive test when it's the right patient. The sensitivity of exercise echocardiography may be diminished if submaximal heart rates are attained. So we try and get 85% uh, of the maximum predicted heart rate. And if you're unable to achieve that, whether it's due to exercise intolerance or they got their AM beta blocker and nobody forgot to discontinue it or whatever it is, your um, sensitivity drops to about 42%. So studies have also compared stress echo and dobutamine stress echo to MPI. Sensitivity of MPI is about 84%, so it's higher, but its specificity is lower than stress echo. So stress echo yields the greatest incremental diagnostic and prognostic value in a patient in whom an exercise treadmill test was non-diagnostic or inconclusive. Uh, so in a patient who's a candidate for a stress echo, it's a better test than an MPI is what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, we are, so indications for stress echo, we're primarily concerned with the diagnosis of coronary artery disease in patients with symptoms suggestive of angina and an intermediate pretest probability. So we'll briefly review the appropriate use criteria for this subset of patients. 
Unfortunately, this was done before the ACC had really cool algorithms and, and slides that I could download, so we just had verbiage. But um, low pretest probability of coronary artery disease plus an interpretable EKG and ability to exercise. Um, oh, let me first point out this. So this is evaluation of the chest pain syndrome. So this is somebody you see in your office with chest pain, right? And they've got an intermediate pretest, or they've got a low pretest probability. Those patients, it's inappropriate to get a stress echo on them. Okay. So th these are chest pain syndrome or anginal equivalent patients again, and they really beef up the uh, indications. Ideally, you have patients that have an uninterpretable EKG, or sorry, or unable to exercise, oops, I gotta go back here, or unable to exercise, or they have intermediate pretest probability or high pretest probability, or their prior stress test is uninterpretable. Those are kind of the keys. They've got to have a higher intermediate pretest probability. Um, so acute chest pain, this is the key. This is the patient who comes to the ER with chest pain, not the guy you're seeing in the office. So inappropriate uses are acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, non-STEMI or STEMI. You don't stress people with ongoing ACS. Um, or a high pretest probability of coronary disease with ST segment change. You don't want to stress those patients either. Um, appropriate uses are intermediate pretest probability of coronary disease, no dynamic ST changes, and serial enzymes are negative. This is an important distinction between MPI and, and uh, stress echo is MPI, it's appropriate to image someone with a equivocal or low uh, uh, cardiac enzyme troponin level, but it's not appropriate to do a stress echo on someone with an elevated troponin level. So we've You've seen a slide similar to this before. Basically, if the patient has symptoms suggestive of angina, they go one of two ways. Either they have possible acute coronary syndrome. That's who you're talking about. They've got a non-diagnostic EKG and normal cardiac biomarkers. Then you come down here and you observe them. You get repeat cardiac biomarkers. And if they're negative, then you come down here and you get a stress test on them. If they're positive, they have confirmed acute coronary syndrome, right? You don't need a stress test them. You need a cath them. So... This is a symptomatic patient with new diagnosed heart failure or chest pain syndrome or anginal equivalent. This is a little additional information for stress echo. It's appropriate um, to stress them when they have intermediate pretest probability and normal LV function. It's an uncertain indication to, to do a dobutamine or stress echo to assess LV systolic function in these patients. Okay. So you just need a baseline echo. So contraindications to exercise stress echo. Uh, they're the same thing as stress testing. No ACS, MI, unstable angina, et cetera. We've covered all that before. Um, note, a permanent pacemaker is not always a contraindication to stress echo because we can take the programmer and externally incrementally increase the pacemaker to get to target heart rate and do an echo that way. It does require that the pacemaker can pace that high and not all of the patients are able to do that, but uh, it is a possibility. So contraindications to giving somebody a dobutamine stress echo, they're very similar. So ongoing angina or acute coronary syndrome, a recent myocardial infarction within one week, unstable angina, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. Keep in mind, if the patient has a history of moderate or greater known AS and symptoms of angina, they may also be due to aortic stenosis and not an acute coronary syndrome. So consider getting a baseline two-dimensional echo to first assess whether or not they've had progression of their aortic stenosis before you stress them. This happens pretty frequently as, some, as we, we unintentionally stress patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and it, it's not good for them. So atrial tachyarrhythmia is an uncontrolled ventricular response like AFib with RVR. History of VT, um, uncontrolled hypertension, thoracic aortic aneurysm. You don't want to give somebody a ton of dobutamine if they've got a known dilated thoracic aneurysm. Left bundle branch block, they already have conduction abnormality. This is the same information about appropriate and inappropriate use, but it's not very legible. Um, so myocardial perfusion imaging, we'll move on to the next set. There's lots of different ways to do uh, uh, imaging studies that, that uh, utilize nuclear isotopes. Here, we do what's called an MPI. We don't do MUGA scanning. We don't do... Uh, PET scanning, we do myocardial perfusion imaging, or SPEX scanning is what it's called. Um, so this can be utilized as an exercise MPI or as a pharmacological MPI study. Okay. So 
the exercise component, obviously, you're going to put them on the treadmill. The pharmacological component, you're going to give them a vasodilator. Here we use Lexistine if we have it in stock or phagodenosine. Keep in mind, you have to hold methyl xanthine, theophylline, caffeine on these patients. It's okay to give them their beta blockers, their calcium channel blockers, because with a vasodilatory study, you're not looking for a target heart rate. You're trying to dilate an artery um, with an adenosine receptor. So this is, I wish they had these for the stress echo because it would make it a lot easier to look at. But basically, this is for uh, appropriate use criteria for patients with ischemic equivalent. Um, so if a patient presents with acute coronary syndrome, it's inappropriate to do an MPI on them, right? If they have possible ACS, then it's appropriate. If you're trying to rule them in, their troponins are negative, their chest pain's equivocal, their intermediate pretest probability, that's appropriate. <coughs> High and intermediate pretest probability patients with chronic uh, ischemic equivalent, it's appropriate to risk stratify them. Um, if their EKG is interpretable and they're able to exercise a pharmacological MPI is inappropriate. So uh, let's, we'll talk about detection of coronary disease in symptomatic patients. These are patients that present with ischemic equivalent consistent of symptoms um, with coronary disease or EKG findings. They were divided based on their likelihood of coronary disease. If a patient had an intermediate or high likelihood of uh, CAD, then uh, nuclear imaging is appropriate. It was also appropriate for patients with low likelihood if they were unable to exercise or had an uninterpretable EKG. Um, for patients with suspected acute coronary syndrome, this is really appropriate. It, this is really important. It's inappropriate irrespective of, uh, I mean, not suspected, I'm sorry. For patients with suspected HDS, it's appropriate regardless of their chimney score, whether or not their troponin levels were elevated. And this is what's different from stress echo. Uh, so to review the evaluation of a patient who presents with or who you see in your office with an ischemic equivalent, so non-acute setting. This is the same thing that chart basically showed, low pretest probability of coronary artery disease and the EKG is interpretable, that's an inappropriate use. What you're looking for is an uninterpretable EKG and a low pretest probability or an intermediate or high pretest probability. Um, acute chest pain, evaluate, you know, using uh, MPI to evaluate patients with acute chest pain, it's inappropriate if they have an ongoing acute coronary syndrome but it is appropriate with possible acute coronary syndrome, EKG, no ischemic changes, um, lower high-risk kidney score, peak troponin can be borderline equivocal or minimally elevated or negative. So this is, uh, and you're looking at low, intermediate, high pretest probability for doing MPI in asymptomatic individuals. So as we talked about risk stratification earlier, um, it's inappropriate in low risk. It's inappropriate in low risk patients who have an interpretable EKG. Um, uncertain if it is interpretable. It's only appropriate in high risk asymptomatic patients. Um, and just to note, if you if you care down there in the bottom, it talks about what's in, what is uh, uh, elevate. Oh, let's see. So contraindications to MPI. Any ongoing acute coronary syndrome, ragadenosin should not be administered to patients with second. This is important here because this is what we use is ragadenosin or Lexistan. It should not be administered to patients with a second degree AV block or sinus node dysfunction unless these patients have a, a functioning pacemaker. So keep that in mind. Additionally, due to the increased risk for fatal myocardial infarction, the FDA issued a warning in November 2013 that ragadenosin and adenosin should not be used for cardiac stress testing in patients with signs or symptoms of unstable angina or cardiovascular instability. I think I've beat that to death. So uh, let's brief review of MI and acute coronary syndrome just so we're all on the same page. An acute coronary syndrome is a type 1 infarct. It's an unstable plaque, a plaque rupture, thrombus formation or a type 4 infarct, which is acute stent thrombosis. So recall that unstable angina is a type of acute coronary syndrome, and stress testing is contraindicated during any ongoing acute coronary syndrome. So if you're calling your patients unstable angina, they're not a candidate for stress testing. I'm missing a slide in here, but that's all right. So I guess we're moving on to CT. So how do we use cardiac CT? We have this technology here. We've had it for, what, about six months now, four months? How many are you doing? One a week, two a week? So we need more, right? Okay. <laughs> so in utilizing the, 
cardiac CT in symptomatic patients with known heart disease, uh, I'm sorry, without known heart disease who are at acute presentation, right? These are the patients that come into the ER. This is our ideal patient population that we're talking about. It's actually appropriate in low pretest probability patients with uh, a normal EKG, normal cardiac biomarkers. Um, so line them up. <laughs> it's appropriate intermediate pretest probability patients. It's inappropriate high pretest probability. Why? Because high pretest probability patients need a cath. Um, and it's inappropriate if they've had an MI, right? Those patients need a cath. So uh, non acute symptoms possibly representing ischemia. These are patients you're seeing in your office. Uh, their EKG is interpretable and they're able to exercise. Um, if so, and their pretest probability of coronary artery disease is intermediate, then you're gung ho, right? It's okay. But if they're low pretest probability and they're able to exercise, this isn't the test for you. You need to do an exercise treadmill test. If they're high pretest probability um, and they're able to exercise, you should either cast them or do a functional study. So if they're not able to exercise and they have low to intermediate pretest probability, it's appropriate. High pretest probability is uncertain. This is a complicated slide that doesn't fit on here very well, but what I really wanted you to get out of it, if there's discordant findings between um, an exercise stress test, let's say the patient had chest pain while they were doing their exercise uh, echo or whatever, but we didn't get any wall motion abnormalities, the stress test was equivocal, then it's appropriate to go ahead and do a second imaging modality on these patients, and a cardiac CT is an ideal imaging modality. Um, if the patients have signs of ischemia, it's unclear whether, you know, if they've got signs of ischemia on their initial stress test, it's unclear whether or not you should do an additional imaging modality. You should really just go straight to cast, in my opinion. Um, and if they have significant ischemia, it's clearly inappropriate. That's what I wanted you to get out of that slide. So if you've got a stress test, you've done a stress test on a patient, it's read as equivocal, some different score on their LexiScan MPI is four, maybe breast artifact, but you still have an intermediate or high pretest probability. You feel really strongly that that patient has symptoms of angina. Get a second imaging modality like a cardiac CT to further define their anatomy and help risk gratify that patient better. Um, asymptomatic patients, this is kind of redundant stuff, but basically for asymptomatic patients when you're trying to do risk assessment on them, they have to have a, high, a positive family history or they have to have uh, an intermediate pretest probability of disease, right? Low pretest probability with a positive family history or intermediate pretest probability. Um, you can go ahead and do it. So other clinical scenarios that we occasionally use, um, uh, cardiac CT. So the pretest probability of coronary disease, low to intermediate with reduced ejection, newly diagnosed low EF, it's appropriate to do that to assess their cardiac anatomy to see if they have ischemic cardiomyopathy is what you're looking for. If they've got a high pretest probability, it's uncertain. You should probably cast those patients. Um, this is the important part of that. So let's kind of put everything together. Pretest probability is your key to getting a reliable cardiac stress test. If they're very low or low pretest probability, based on um, the whatever formula you choose to assess, I like the age, gender, typical, atypical, non-cardiac chest pain, somatic. Um, you know, the patients need limited, if any, stress testing. If they come in in the acute setting, everyone feels obligated to get a stress test on those patients. But if they're low or very low risk, even when they come to the hospital, get, a, get an echo on them or an outpatient echo. You know, the guidelines say that, that low and, and uh, very low patients, you can just get a stress test within 72 hours. So send them home, get an outpatient exercise test. High pretest probability of patients may undergo stress testing as an outpatient, but in the acute setting, they should, you should consider angiography for those patients. Um, we do not perform cardiac stress testing on patients with an ongoing acute coronary syndrome. The ACC recommends a minimum of 48 hours after resolution of their acute coronary syndrome before undergoing any form of stress testing. So if they've had an MI, whether it's a STEMI or a non-STEMI, or you're calling it unstable angina, you need to wait two days before you stress them to see how much myocardium was at risk or injured. So if your patient comes in with chest pain syndrome concerning for acute coronary syndrome and you want to get them stressed tomorrow, it's a lot better to write possible acute coronary syndrome or possible unstable angina versus unstable angina. 
If they rule in by symptoms, biomarkers, or EKG changes, whatever, you can change this to a definitive ACS diagnosis like unstable angina, non STEMI, or STEMI. But if they rule out and have a negative stress test, then consider changing your discharge diagnosis to chest pain syndrome or non cardiac chest pain. So we don't stress patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And just to clarify, this has happened at both hospitals I train at. They occasionally get on the treadmill or they get dobutamine. And so to review the classic symptoms of uh, severe aortic stenosis, it's angina, syncope, or heart failure. So if you've got a patient with known aortic stenosis or they've got a systolic ejection murmur and they don't have a baseline echo and they come in with one of those three symptoms, stress testing them off the bat probably isn't the best call. You may want to consider getting a two-dimensional echo first to assess their aortic valve prior to putting them on the treadmill or giving them a stress agent. Um, cardiac CT, the only reason I go over this is because we do it, it happens fairly frequently that we inappropriately stress someone and put them at risk of harm. Uh, cardiac CT is a useful modality in an acute setting, and if a recent stress test is non-diagnostic or equivocal and pretest probability is moderate to high, get the cardiac CT to, you know, help confirm your suspicions. Any questions? All right. Adios. <laughs>